Since 2010, Daniel Medin has taught comparative literature in English at the American University of Paris. Additionally, he is the Associate Director of the Centre for Writers and Translators and an editor of its Cahier series. Daniel Medin also co-edits Music and Literature magazine, edits the White Review's annual translation issue, and advises several journals and presses on contemporary international fiction. The former judge for leading translation prizes in the United States, Best Translated Book Award, and the United Kingdom, Man Booker International Prize, he is now on the jury of their German equivalent, HKW International Literer. No, you're going to have to help me on the pronunciation there. The Internationale Literatur Prize, International Literature Prize. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, and welcome to the Bibliophile. Thank you. So you've been a judge on some very important international book prizes, and that's what I'd like to focus on today. Mm -hmm. What do you look for in a translated book into English? It's a broad question, um, and it depends in part, of course, on the circumstances and the criteria as well as how they are defined by the prize. By my own inclinations, I think that for me the most important thing is literary quality. Of course, there's a, there's a specific context to every single prize. There's always the question that comes up during the long list and short list discussions in terms of effect versus, you know, quality of text. And then how each judge defines quality is going to vary from yeah. one person to the next. What is the best? Nobody has the same criteria. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. For myself as a reader, um, I think that I'm, I'm interested in work that is novel to me, in mm -hmm. work that I find formally innovative, that attempts to do something new or something at least that I have never seen happen before, I enjoy discoveries. I like to find um, authors that I've never read before from languages that are less less frequently represented in translation. Um, so I think there's a, a, a lot of curiosity drives my reading, mm -hmm. even though w what, you know, what determines preference has a lot to do, I think, with, with, with form itself, with the sentences, with the construction of the novel. Okay. If it's an award for best translation, mm -hmm. you should have an idea of what it started out like in the first original language and your reading in English, correct? That's a question for debate, and this is something that comes up in discussions for each of these prizes, um, and not least because the moment that you have a translation prize, I think... Well, each one of them, they are translation prizes because the translators are rewarded as well. In each case, it's either a slightly lesser percentage or the prize is divided in half, right? So, right. Whatever the, so on the one hand, you're trying to award a prize for the best book, right? Yeah. On the other hand, you want to take into consideration the quality of the translation. And again, judges differ in terms of like how to weigh that. It, it's discussed on every single jury. Obviously, a translator has, a, and there are usually translators on every single jury as well, um, and that's a very particular perspective. What's challenging for me is I feel to, on the one hand, I have the experiences as a reader, I'm curious, and uh, because I have these other languages, when I do have the opportunity, um, and you're supposed to reread books, <laughs> this has something to do with making them new, is, is I like to compare it to the original. Well, I feel, though, that professionally, because I can do that with French, and I can do that with German. I cannot do that with Korean. I cannot do that with Arabic. I cannot do that with Ukrainian. I can't do it with anything else, really. Yeah, yeah. So, um, there... so you're giving the, the, the languages that you have an understanding of, if you're able to read them in the original and then the English, but you can't for others, you're, you're sort feel, of doing yeah. a, an injustice to the ones you can't read in the original. It's not so much injustice, I think, in order to be f fair uh, and they ultimately have to be prizes that take into account, for most, the quality of the book as a work in that language, which means for the Booker or Best Translated Book Award, how does this Chinese novel work as a novel by a Chinese writer in English? Yes, um, exactly. That's... Or in the case of the German prize, you know, how does it, you know, how does the German work as a German book? Yeah. To me, that has to be the ultimate, you know, that's that's the question. So you're uh, not really measuring the the sort of quality of the translation itself. You're measuring how good it is in English. 
Well, good is also, like I said, it's, it's a debatable term. And, and no, I think any kind of experienced reading allows you to discern between translators who have a greater arsenal, who, who are able to, uh, where the translation seems authoritative or appears to be authoritative or um, authoritatively rendered or rendered with, with greater resources um, than, than other translators. You do have wooden translations, but you can only infer these things. Yeah. For so me, the difficult there. question is what to do because uh, you want to be fair to all titles. So, so I could say, personal curiosity drives me to read the originals of those originals that I can read. Right. But I try not to let that interfere too much into some of the critiques I might make because I can't level the same sort of you know arguments against books from other languages. And yeah. I, and that's fine with me, right? If there's something that I you know, that, that, that I dislike about uh, the sentences in, in, in the German, often it will be recreated in the English, and I can make that argument on the basis of certain things, um, like I said, as it works, as a, how it is as a book in English. Yeah. But, but I think you're still, I think ultimately, there's the understanding that whatever, you're, you're still judging a book, and I think the quality of the book is, 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 formo is, is, is really essential, and then there's an awareness that if it reads especially well, or if this is a writer who's doing something formally interesting and that is conveyed in the English, you know, it's, 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 it's like an extraordinary piece of, of, of composed music, right? It's, um, it's, it, 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 it lives because of the interpreter, right? Mm -hmm. The quality is already there inherently, but it, the interpreter plays a role in, in how you experience that. Yeah. So I think it's that's that's the sort of prioritization is reading these things as books and judging them on, as books, but, but also very sensitive to the nuances uh, in English or in German, whatever the case might be. Okay. What's the best advice you can give to someone who's res at, at a publishing house mm -hmm. whose responsibility it is to find a translator for a book that they've just acquired? I guess it depends on the publisher. I mean, there are so many good translators out there, um, and the question is, how do you how do you divide your time, right? How do you <laughs> when there's so many demands on one's time? But I think what's, for what's anybody the best attentive, advice you can give that that person? Oh, I think that there are, for example, in the English language world, there is a, a, an ever growing community of translators and advocates of translators. Um, and they write. They're active, and it's not difficult to follow certain blogs like uh, the Complete Review um, by Michael Orthoffer and the Literary Salon, or Chad Post's blog on Three Percent, or people like Veronica Esposito who writes regularly uh, regularly about literature and translation. These people are out there on social media, but but in in print, digital, and on the page too. The advice they, there exists to follow them. I would say, for example, to read Michael Orthoffer's blog, it takes about three minutes to four minutes every day. I require, when I teach an introduction to contemporary world literature, I require students to do that um, and then choose one article to do a deeper dive into because he links to many things. And after six months, you're going to have a much better sense of, of what is out there, how the publishing world works. Uh, you're going to become better acquainted with who's winning prizes where, um, and it gets you that leg up. Um, in terms of finding a good translator, it also depends on the language as well. Um, the number of translators, exceptional translators who work from Hungarian, it's going to be smaller than the number of exceptional translators who work from French. And chances are there's probably a waiting list for those, you know, <laughs> right, um, right. top dogs, as it were. I'd say the records, you can also look at records, who has done other work from those languages, what has, what has been successful in the past, mm -hmm. um, experienced editors, both of magazines and publishers, um, have their lists of people they like to work with. But they're kind of guarding them because they don't want them to get too busy, right? Possibly. I, suppose, possibly. I don't know. Possibly. I think there, there are also open secrets. There's so much excellent literature that does not make it into English at any given moment. And um, I think a very good example of this is, uh, and the evidence of this is something like uh, Jacques Testat, who runs Fitzcarraldo, who founded the White Review years ago. What's Fitzcarraldo? It's a, it's a, it's a publisher, a uh, UK-based publisher of essays and fiction. Very much kind of like 
taking up as it were, the gauntlet from New Directions and trying to bring innovative fiction to give it a home in, uh, in, in the UK and also at a moment when uh, the kind of attentive spans of publishers has become shorter and shorter, he has a very long view in terms of representing the same author over and over again, that kind of loyalty, and mm. with the trust that if you have an aesthetically interesting program and that you remain loyal to the authors and you work with excellent translators, that you will have your successes. And he's actually, unfortunately, for the rest of us, because it allows him to continue the project, um, had a great deal of luck from the beginning. So, so picking somebody like Svetlana Alexievich, who was one of his first authors, and it was immediately before the Nobel Prize. And so, and he had the English language rights, um, which was fantastic because, like I said, it extended the longevity of the press. But, you know, it's not as though Alexievich had been left untranslated into English. There were a couple of things here and there. Chad Post, when he was at Dalkey, was involved with one of them, which was a big success, called Voices from Chernobyl. But other than that, I mean, I mean, I became aware of her because in France, she's a very successful author. You know, and I think Jacques read her other work in French as well. That was part of what enabled him to get a leg up on, on this particular book and know about mm -hmm. it. All of which is to say, there are many authors who are they're kind of like open secrets. There's too that much. Be, there's been too been. much good literature in the world, yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. and uh, there's, there's not a shortage of capable translators. There's 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 commercial pressure. I think that's it. and perceptions of commercial pressure um, in the UK and the US and in Australia. That's the greater challenge. Um, there are plenty of of good translators. So and the greater challenge is to get English language publishers to publish more works in translation. I would say yes, given that they do it correctly. And by correctly, that means systematically and with nuance. So you have, we could talk about the United States, um, publishers that are well known for this. They've built their reputations on it, uh, New Directions for, for decades, right? Or Archipelago in New York. Mm -hmm. and, and now there are two smaller ones like Transit in San Francisco. And anyways, they, I could go on, but they're just yeah. listing presses. This is part of their aesthetic program. They have founded the press with this this in mind. And of course they're doing great books. And now that there are larger prizes that they can enter these titles for, they're, you know, they're starting to win prizes. That's what I meant with, with, with I mentioned Jacques, because I was thinking of Olga Tokarczuk, Ilnen Tokarczuk, who's a Polish writer, very established at something like 10, 12 books. Um, and, you know, there had been a few books published in the UK ages ago that had gone out of print, and that was it. And Jacques decided to dedicate himself to her body of work. And, uh, you know, Flights just won the Man Booker International. And he's been in this only three or four years. So, like I said, but Tokarczuk was an open secret. You know, she was out there. It's just... But it wasn't just publishing a book of hers. I think that the thing is that, again, Jacques, is he's created a brand. All of these presses create a brand. They're very active. They're active within the community of, of literary-minded people, whether they're bloggers, whether they're reviewers, whether they're authors who read. You know, these are all the kinds of people who promote, who are essential to the promotion of an interesting novel. Who can spread? Who spread the word ultimately? Mm. And uh, and I think they're known by reputation ultimately uh, mm -hmm. for that reason. If you just, as major presses do, buy one book and you throw it out there and it doesn't get the kind of support it needs and it's a very short term project, um, then the likelihood of that book just disappearing is 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 all the greater. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'd say so it's. Yes, people should be publishing it, but it also has to do with a way that the book is published that gives it a chance to yeah. survive and to build an audience. So it stands a much better chance of doing well, and that author doing well, if the publishing firm has as a mandate to do that kind of thing. Or an understanding for it. There are people who are with major presses like FSG and so on, and, and they're very aware of that. And luckily, luckily, even if fewer people do read today, there's still the prestige counts for something mm. in many places, even because people do have to make a living. You know, <laughs> it does, you don't want to lose money in your business. And, uh, and fortunately, I mean, when, when, when the best of all possible worlds, you know, you'd, it's even among the commercial publishers, you have, uh, there's an understanding that 
very commercially successful work can make it possible to do the prestigious you know the prestigious books that don't sell it as well mm -hmm. whether it's mm -hmm. even in English right William Gass and I think Cynthia Ozick these other figures who who are kind of pillars um, of, of, of contemporary American literature don't have the numbers but Knopf can do them because of other authors on their list yeah. and so yeah. that prestige does count for something is it harder to make money with a book that's in translation yes Oh, there's no hesitation. The costs are greater. The you costs have... are greater, and the fact is, you can't often have that author if they don't speak English. Yes, going Promotion. around promoting it. You could say that many publishers have prejudices, and there, there exist certain reasons that would reinforce those prejudices. Um, the, the question is to whether or not. I mean, in my experience, yeah, you do have costs. Are they it's more complicated. Like what are they? What are the costs? Well, it depends. It depends on the cost of the translator. It depends on the length of the book. Uh, let's okay. Since I mentioned Tolkarchuk, let's talk about the challenges of Tolkarchuk shoes. The Nike Award is the the it's the premier prize, literary prize in Poland, and she's won it twice. Um, once for this book, Flights, seven or eight years ago, which she just won right. in the English language world. I think it was the same with the Vegetarian in Hang Kang. It had been seven, eight years since she had published that book, and then it made her a star in English seven or eight years later, or elsewhere in the world. But Tokarczuk won it the second time for a book called the. It's a novel called The Books of Jacob. It's an 800-900 page book about uh, a sect of, of Jews in, I think it's 18th century Poland. Um, and it's a long book. And the translator is an advocate. This is Jennifer Croft, who just um, won for flights, the translation. Mm -hmm. um, and, she, and you could see her publishing an excerpt in Bomb, talking about it here, talking about it there, trying to find a publisher. And there it's it's, it's uphill, right? Because um, you have to pay a translator. You're paying usually by the word. And this is an 800 to 900 page novel about an ostensibly esoteric topic, which in Poland it was a bestseller because it's dealing with Polish history and certain yeah. things that Polish readers don't usually confront or don't even like to confront. But of course, here's an author, how do you pronounce your name in English, and it's 800, 900 pages, mm. and it's dealing with Polish history. Mm. These are all things that would reinforce the prejudice of a commercially-minded publisher. For sure. Um, how much it costs, to, how much do translators typically charge? Oh, it varies. It varies. From what it to varies. what? It varies. I don't have the exact, because the U.S. is different, the U.K. is different. It depends okay. on whether you have, what always confuses me when I have editorial work to do in Germany or France, like even how you measure, whether it's per word. In France, often they measure per character. So oh, that means goodness. in the period you can get paid for it, the <laughs> semicolon there. Right. Uh, so, so, um, but is it like a dollar a word? or? It's. I, can, I have to leave it general. I have to leave it general because it varies so wide. I mean, there, there do, do exist standards, but I don't yeah. have them off the top of my, sure, my okay. head. Okay. I can just say that a long book will pay well. But, or what will seem on the surface very expensive to a publisher. If you're dealing with an 800-page novel with, mm -hmm. with a fair publisher, a fair-minded publisher, it's going to be expensive. Um, and it may seem very expensive. Of course, it's a lot of work. The translation of an 800 to 900-page novel uh, merits that money. It, it probably merits even more if you take into account the fact that they have to do research, that it's not that a translator is not just an audit somebody who converts words but also has to look things up may or may not correspond with the author you know i mean especially with an ambitious novel it usually requires extra work as well that makes that money i mean it's the sort of thing that if you break it down to how much are you getting paid a minute it's or 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 for a day you know it's it's, it's shameful it's yeah shameful. It's, yeah okay so. good translation conveys the meaning of the original text nothing more nothing less. Great translation makes you think that it's the original text. Do you agree with that? No. No, I think I understand where that's coming from, but um, this goes back to the earlier question about you know, prizes um, and how you have different, different definitions of good. I think there are certain instances like I said, I like formally innovative fiction. Um, Clarice Lispector is the first example that comes to mind. By reputation, her sentences are not conventional or beautiful in Portuguese. They are strange. They are odd. They are prickly. And you know, so so when these are, what does it mean to translate that well? Um, 
according to one view, which seemed to be the first one that you cited, it might require smoothing out things that look ungrammatical. But it looked ungrammatical in Portuguese, too, right? Because <laughs> it's, 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 I think it can be reduced. The, the risk is that you reduced good translation to readability. And readability does count. That means that for a, good, a translator who can produce a highly readable text, has control over syntax, has control over rhythm, is sensitive to all of these things, and that does count for something. But I think what you have to take into account is the aspiration of the work itself. And optimally, but you can only do this analogically, not as a kind of mirror, really, because um, you want to reproduce the effect in English that a reader might have in the original language. Yeah. But there's no perfect correspondence to that, right? That's mm -hmm. why it's an, it, it, it can only be analogical. Um, it can only be at a distance, or I think the way that I don't often go into translation theory, but this is a very metaphoric translation theory. Benjamin refers to it as like the echo, right? It's almost like finding the right echo in your language, um, which is already, <laughs> I mean, it's, I think that's um, extraordinary, rare, difficult, and, and hard to kind of break down. So no, there are certain circumstances in which I think it makes sense to produce something that may not immediately look good in English. Or another good case or example would be to take Nabokov's translation of Eugene Onegin, which mm -hmm. I find almost unreadable because he is trying to find literal equivalents in English. He's trying to make absolutely no allowances in terms of the English language and what it's supposed to do. Um, he, he wants to kind of... <laughs> ram the original through into English, which makes ultimately for a very difficult text. Um, text. But I think, yeah. what, I mean, this quote is talking about the meaning, conveying the yeah, meaning but, of the original. But literary text... And nothing are, else. Yeah, but literary texts, meaning is only a part of literary texts. Literary texts have to do with, I mean, the, the surface, it has to do with style. How do you create yeah. a style? What's the effect yeah. of a sentence? What's the effect of a, a rhythm... Um, when you're surprised by something, at some level, that, that, that can be plot. But when I think of an author like Claire Louise Bennett, somebody that I really admire, a contemporary British writer, um, it can just be diction. It's, 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 it's that particular word appearing in this sentence at this sudden moment that causes me to sit up and, and, and laugh yeah. with an admiring shock. you know, um, And to kind of try to eliminate that from the formula seems meaning is a part plot is a part but it's it is not everything at all sure. it's, um... translation is that which transforms everything so that nothing changes that's Gunter Grass mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe you heard that before I don't know no but it sounds similar to, to the joke a friend of mine has about, you know, it's the translator is, is somebody who, who reads, basically rewrites every single word of the book, you know, it says that there's nothing left from the original. And I think that's part of the paradox of translation, which is very beautiful, is that it is and is not, uh, it does and does not belong to the author. It has to be recreated within a different set of linguistic signs, rules, all of the associations that accompany the literary histories <laughs> of, of those two different... I mean, it has to move from one into another, and it can never do so smoothly. And then you, you even have, you know, the difference between French and Spanish, where you might have a greater number of potential parallels for the translator to draw on, um, are not the same for... Spanish, when well, Spanish and Arabic is maybe yes. Why not Spanish and Arabic? Say a Semitic language or or an Asian language. I mean, you, you actually can have greater gaps where the where it's even more difficult to replicate. I recall this experience trying to translate poetry from Hebrew as a student years and years ago, and acknowledging there's something that is moving in the original Hebrew that can appear kitschy or sentimental when translated literally into English. And it has to do with, again, the tradition, and then also what is possible when you convert from one language to the next. Mm -hmm. The advantage of Romance languages is you have a certain... There have been many 
translations between those languages already. So presumably the translator has a certain number of alternatives and then linguistically, although there are false friends as well, to be aware of, um, you know, the distance is not so great. Okay. I mean, I think it's difficult to channel, I mean, translating from Chinese is, um, yeah. I, bet they, <laughs> is I think, uh, extraordinary. Um, the challenges are very different. I don't want to say greater, but it's different because the distance between the languages yeah. is greater from that someone working from another European language. Yeah, it's a whole new world view, isn't it? Yeah. I've heard the claim that, uh, that each generation needs its own translation. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because with Tolstoy, War and Peace, or, or it may have been Anna Karenina, the Pavir Vodohonsky translation. There you uh, go. That's their latest, and they have a new Chekhov coming up. But I don't know if you know this, Richard Pavir is an AUP alum. Oh, I didn't he, know he that. He was a professor no. here for many, many years, oh, okay. and he's still based here in Paris. What I'm going to say, though, is that I preferred, I think it was the Constance Garnett, Garnett mm -hmm. translation to mm -hmm. the new one. So what is this about each generation? I think I read it in, in the context of these people translating it's yeah. this is your generation's version i preferred the old one what does that mm -hmm. say about me I think what does that say about this new generation it reminds me of so my son was um when he was young he was really into this version of of, of mozart's sinfonia concertante and he would just watch it over and over and over again and one day i played him a different version He's like, they're playing too fast. That's the wrong way. That's yes. the wrong way. And I think this is, everybody has this experience when you fall in love with a work yeah. and a particular interpretation of it. The first one always has this almost immovable place in, in your recollection and everything else is relative to that. So, I mean, what does it mean too fast? Actually, maybe it's closer to the, the score. I just don't, it's just too fast to this other work that has become canonical to me, yeah. right? And, yeah. and the principal work. That's what and, happened, yeah. And I think it's, what's interesting with, and, that, and it's not just the Pavir versus Constance Garnet, which has been, you know, anytime a contemporary translator is, is very successful, there's an article in the New York Review of Books, or there's an argument in the letter section. It was the same thing when Lydia Davis did the Proust, you know, Andre Osman prefers the old translation, uh, you know, and thinks that this is the right way to do it, and somebody else thinks this is the other way to do it. Um, you mentioned Gunter Grass, Brian Mitchell retranslated, you know, the Tin Drum. Do we need a new translation already? You know, when isn't Ralph Mannheim good enough? You know, and um, there are very interesting questions. I think you're right in the way that you point it back to the reader, because of course, language does change. I've studied Kafka, I usually teach, it depends on the course. If I'm teaching him in the context of a writing class or something more general, then I pick a recent translation like Michael Hoffman's. Um, but if it's uh, for a course that's just w dealing with Kafka's life and work, then I teach the old ones um, by the Muirs, largely because the edition is collected Kafka. It separates it, the work between what was published during his lifetime, what was published posthumously, its chronological and but even there, the language ages. They're masterful translations, but uh, they're from the 1920s. And of course, the English language has changed in 100 years. It doesn't necessarily mean it's better, though. It's changed. It's just a different translation. Yeah. As I, re I recall, when Brian Mitchell's translation of the Trial came out, I think it was Cynthia Ozick. It's a small, like I said, it's a small world who reviewed it and points out that it's a very American-sounding translation. I don't see why there needs to be one. Commercially, yeah. obviously, there's pressure. There's yeah. always pressure. Mm -hmm. um, what I find particularly valuable is 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 when a canon a canon is expanded by very good translators. That books that had been lesser known or untranslated are also taken on by these other translators later. But for example, it's also I, for me the musical comparison is is a is a very useful one. So if if we think of Pavir and Volochonsky as like these um, great performers or as kind of like violin virtuosos, it's, um, I like, I love their Dostoevsky, I, you know, it's, yeah, it's but, right. but their Gogol, I like less, you know, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's sort of like saying like, I like Brendel doing Mozart and Beethoven, but Liszt, I don't quite, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I prefer somebody else for Liszt. You know? And there's, th there's a choice now. Yeah, there's a choice. You know. Thank heavens. Thank yeah. heavens. And I don't see why, uh, this was one of the things when Janet Malcolm wrote her piece in the New York Review trying to 
attack, well, not trying, attacking uh, the 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 Pavir and Volochonsky translations. I mean, it's it's not one or the other. It's not mm. one or the other. You're not required to read the Pavirs just because they're it's doing it's this new. work. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for me, that's how I found out about AUP in the first place. I read every Dostoevsky translation as it came out in the 90s, and I was thrilled. So these, these translations were alive to me. And yeah, of course I had read Dostoevsky before in Constance Garnet, but there was more attention on this. This was a more contemporary language. You well, know, it spoke to you, uh, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Well, yeah. it was Dostoevsky speaking to me, but, uh, well, but there was something... Yeah. Very, it's a different Dostoevsky, but though. when you get three, four works by the same person, you start to think maybe, and they're all very strong. You start to think, this is a damn good violinist, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, because yeah. it's yeah. hard enough to be good once, right? <laughs> so it's, it's, it, when you have this repeated experience with multiple titles, then uh, then that's true. But yeah. I mean, Constance Garnett translated everything. I yeah, mean, she's she, everything up to a certain historical point. It's impossible to do any of the classics without retranslating those authors. Um, just uh, winding up, uh, let, let's stick with the musical analogy. Cultural, historical, geographic references that the plot may hinge on, what the translator needs to do is to help the reader to understand those, as well as things like slang and colloquialisms mm -hmm. and wordplay. So how do we put that in musical terms and... How does the translator help the reader to understand? I'm not sure how to put it in musical terms. I think in in this respect, it's very much a question of editorial preference. If you're a scholarly press and you want everything, everything essential visible, then you can have notes. Then you allow end notes or footnotes or textual notes or a glossary. But if it's, if it's going to be in any way commercial, you want to reduce those to the absolute minimum and optimally have none whatsoever. In which case, there are all sorts of tricks that the translator has, like the what is stealth gloss was one term, um, where you actually provide a definition of something that you assume that your target reader won't be aware of within the sentence in a natural and organic way that doesn't <laughs> the sort of thing that might otherwise be communicated in a footnote but is not artificial within the context of the sentence um, so that you're secretly providing the information to the reader I think those an experienced translator an experienced editor um, will be able to they're familiar with these techniques and mm -hmm. I think that's important to be able to do that um, can, you, can you name some of those techniques well I think still that, that 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 kind of glossing text is is, is is an essential one that comes up very often where mm -hmm. you're trying to account for information that is that, that was the right the question information that is cultural or very particular historical geographic yeah, references yeah. that the yeah. plot, plot hinges on yeah, yeah. that you you try to integrate those you have to basically write something you have, but pretend that it's within the text yeah. originally, almost create something parenthetical that's not in parentheses, um, adding, you're adding to the original, right. essentially. But you have to do that in a nuanced way that won't disturb, that it won't somehow make it pedantic or change the voice of the author. That mm -hmm. it seems as or overridden. It seems as naturally there. Yeah. Right? Um, but it's also the translator and the editor who makes those decisions. How much... And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about two different kinds of good in terms of fidelity. How, to what extent should a work in translation remain foreign? If this is a text about Pakistan and and uh, or northern Nigeria and uh, and you know the experience of Islam in these places, which is varied and far more complex than somebody of my you know uh, biographical background may be familiar with. Are you maybe doing an injustice in explaining every single thing? I mean, this is, if something is foreign, not everything should be domesticated mm -hmm. in the translation. Mm -hmm. I think it's the should author be some and the editor. That you might want to oh, follow up yourself. There's, should, it, it should be transported into English, but not every concept has to be explained, especially yeah. if those concepts are unfamiliar. We also live in a Google age. I think some, the uh, one rule of thumb is if it can be easily looked up, you know, then the people can do that work if they're curious. But I think it's really up to the the editor and the translator to determine to what extent 
Yeah, the term is domestic. Domest, you know, do you domesticate? I see. A yeah. translation. Yeah. And the cultural elements in that translation um, make it more readily palatable mm -hmm. to the reader. Yeah. And in my experience, it's the, the Nabokov is one extreme where nothing is. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. Basically, the compromise is that I'm going to find English equivalents to these things in Russian, you know, and that's already a, a, an unforgivable compromise. But yeah. but but that's but that's it, you know. Um, and uh, and then you have others that try to make and explain everything. I think editorially, my experience is that it's you're you're always compromising. What you don't want is for a reader to be turned off by a book that is very good at its heart because there's too much that is unfamiliar at the other on the other hand you don't want to uh pretend that a book is something other than what it is so i mean the, the, Jap translations from japanese and murakami in pr particular is a good example because i think the murakami translations into english are i don't know the percentages but but they're 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 brutally cut um and one might say, okay, well, that happens with English language novels for the better too, but it's almost systematically so. With with and and these are books that are commercially successful, and so obviously they continue to do it. Mm. I have little doubt that what people experience as Murakami in English is not radically different um, from what people say experience as Murakami esque in a book that's fifty pages longer in German, you know. Mm. But those pages those lines are missing and that's an editor's decision and uh and there are circumstances that inform that each time my experience is always a kind of compromise between the two just finally uh you've you've done a lot of reading perhaps you could name the two or three writers that may not be that well known that, mm -hmm. but that have blown your head off or mm -hmm. just you think would blow the reader away well, every reader is different, but based on the response your, will be different. Opinion. My response will be different every, you know, three to six months. Yeah, but, but something must have yeah. stuck with you. Well, I think for me, one of the greats is is, is Lazo Krasnorkai, who is known increasingly to you know, to a wider, larger and larger number of readers, um, the Hungarian author, and more of, and I think his reputation is growing as more of that body of work is translated into English um, and other languages as well. Any title. Oh God! All of his work is great. I think Seyobo, uh, there below, is is extraordinary. That's um, that came out two, three years ago. One Seyobo. Seyobo, there below. Okay. Um, which is in the UK and the US. I think you can't go wrong. I mean, Melancholy of Resistance is very good. Satan Tango is very good. You really can't go wrong with his work. Um, mm. Even a short work like uh, The Last Wolf, which is a one sentence story. Of about forty pages, and is published as a book with with an older story. Or, Animal Inside, our little you know Kaye that we did um, with illustrations by uh, Max Neumann. I think you experience a great writer, um, and you can either experience the great writer in this forty-page format, or in the three hundred-page format. And the scale is is different, and will be correspondingly so in t in terms of your experience, but. I think even with the 40 pages, you're, you're getting what is extraordinary about his sentences and his writing and about his mind and the way it moves. Books that I'm particularly excited about, one of which will appear in English in a year or two, I think there's a, a Ukrainian novelist, well, poet, really, named Sergei Jadan, and uh, Yale University Press just published um, an older novel of his called Mesopotam Mesopotamia, and the new one is called Internat and it is set uh, in the Donbass in the Ukraine three years ago. It's, 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 it's almost from the front line of the, the war there. And mm. I usually hate war novels. It's actually something that I dislike as a genre, and I read very skeptically. I do like Jadan as an author, and so I read this with curiosity, and it's, it's narrated almost exclusively in the present tense, and it's a phenomenal, um, it's a phenomenal novel. There is a short story writer uh, and novelist from Japan who's quite young uh, named uh, Aoyama. Here, yeah. Nane Aoyama. And I get maybe blown away is not quite the word for it or the way to describe the experience of it, but as I said earlier, there's more than one kind of good. And uh, there's this filmmaker that I loved from Japan, uh, Yasujiro Ozu, and he has these. He specializes in these very modest domestic dramas, 
Um, and I find her short fiction uh, reminds me a great deal of that. Uh, very understated, you know, they're, they're, they're novellas, long stories, too short to call a novel in any respect, about family relations, and uh, she's quite good, and I hope to have something of hers in the White Review at some point in the near future. If I had more time to think of this, I would no. That's a perfect. Long list. That's no, no. That's <laughs> great. I just want to. I want yeah. people, if uh, people who are listening to. Uh, oh, can I say one more? If one, yeah, one certainly. More. Yeah. Um, I would say Samantha Schweblin. Um, she's an Argentinian author of increasingly greater renown, um, but she hasn't published that many books in English yet. She also specializes in the in the short form. Um, her first novel. Fever Dream was shortlisted for the Man Booker International last year, so obviously she's being translated. She has another collection of stories um, that will appear in English next year, and they're older stories, it's appearing for the first time in English, and they're phenomenal, they're fantastic, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it will be called Birds in the Mouth or something like that, and it will be published in the U.S. and in the U.K. And, um, Do you know who's the publisher is? Yes, it's uh, Riverhead in the U.S., and it will be uh, One World, I think, in the U.K. Great. Thanks very much for your recommendations and your insights into uh, the world of translation. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I've been speaking to Daniel Medin, who is Associate Professor yeah. at the American University of Paris. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you.